today in this webinar. Um, Vietnam is a country endowed with very good wind resources, and GWAC views Vietnam as a market with huge potential for both onshore and offshore. And last year, the government of Vietnam raised the feed-in tariff, which led to a booming of wind product development. And Vietnam is literally now becoming the most promising wind market in Southeast Asia now. And in the meantime, the offshore um, wind is also developing, um, taking off with the kickoff of the Futong project developed by, by Mainstream, which we'll hear um, more details about that uh, later in the webinar today. And although um, offshore sector is still um, quite nascent, but there's a huge potential for, for, for the offshore development in the future here in Vietnam. And two weeks ago, just barely two weeks ago, GWAC hosted our first Global Offshore Wind Summit in Taipei. And we've got lots of interests around the offshore development in Vietnam back there. Um, so those are like all the promising side of the thing, but um, there's always a but. <laughs> so the development in Vietnam is not without challenges. Um, there's still lots of issues on policy, permitting, finance for both onshore and offshore. And this is why um, GWEC is hosting a two-day event in, um, of Vietnam Wind Power on 11th to 12th of June in Hanoi. And this year is the second edition uh, of uh, Vietnam Wind Power. The two-day event will feature a finance workshop on accelerating wind product financing in Vietnam. where We're inviting um, developers, financial institutions, international and local banks to look into the challenges of product financing in Vietnam as well as new sources for finance available for wind sector. Um, we also have an offshore roundtable discussion, which is a roundtable um, to get the Vietnam government, as well as the wind in the offshore wind industry, all together to discuss about the, the way forward for the offshore. Um, and on 12th of, of June, there's a whole day main conference similar to what we did last year, where there's a high level keynote presentation followed by CEO forum as well as breakout sessions on policy, finance, technology, and infrastructure in the afternoon. And it will be a great two-day um, event for networking and for getting uh, the most updated information about Vietnam wind development. And if you're interested in Vietnam, I would encourage you to come and join us there. And that's a lot on, on the Vietnam wind power. Um, and now um, back to this webinar today. This webinar today it intends to provide people interested in Vietnam an opportunity to get more information about some of the key issues. Uh, some of the key issues now. A, on the overall policy development, and B, on the challenges and the way out on project financing, and C, on the nascent um, offshore development. And this is how our webinar will be structured today. And our first speaker would be Naveen Balachandra, who is the special advisor for GWAC, um, who will provide a brief introduction on the Vietnam wind power market, um, followed by Olivier Duguet, CEO of Blue Circle, who will outline the key challenges related to project finance. And the last speaker is Bernard Cassie, development director um, of Vietnam for mainstream renewable power, um, who will look into the offshore development in Vietnam now. And with not further delay, I'll introduce our first speaker, um, Naveen. Naveen, over to you. Thank you, Vio. Thank you, Leming. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, uh, kind of give you an overview of the Vietnam market. Now, Vietnam is a market which has strong fundamentals for renewable energy. As you can see, it has a population of around 96.7 million people, a GDP growth of around 7%, and power growth of around 10.5%. Very few markets in this region have such strong fundamentals. It's a growing economy, and this means increase in energy demand. Now, how does this translate to the power landscape of Vietnam? You'll notice that uh, the power demand and the installed capacity has been growing every year. According to the Power Development Plan, or PDP is what they call, 2020 to 2030, the government expects the power demand to be close to about 506 terawatt hour and uh, installed capacity of about 130 gigawatt, which is about an annualized growth of uh, around 
12 to 14 percent. I mean, one can't be too surprised by by these numbers because if if you have a growing economy, you are likely to see um, uh, the energy increase as well, up to 12 to 14 percent growth rates. Now you will notice that. Uh, from the energy mix, so far coal has been the preferred source of energy along with hydro and uh, hence it occupies uh, a large share of the energy mix. And renewable energy has got this very paltry share of around 5.8% and uh, this includes wind, solar, small hydro, bio, biogas, etc. Now this, uh, hopefully we are looking at you know, changing this scenario dramatically over the coming years. Let's, um, when, when we look at wind uh, specifically in Vietnam and the landscape there, uh, as Liming mentioned, uh, Vietnam has very rich wind resource. Uh, most of the good sites you know, can be found in the Mekong Delta and the central uh, uh, highlands. The uh, project which, uh, uh, mainstream is going to be doing is actually in the Mekong Delta, which Bernard will talk a bit more during his um, his session. Now, uh, what uh, what we are seeing now is uh, the installed base uh, from GVEC, which they announced earlier this year, was around 228 uh, megawatts, and around 32 megawatts to be the new capacity. You need to keep in mind that. The reason why we say the wind resource is good in Vietnam is because uh, the wind speeds around Mekong Delta and Central Highlands is roughly around seven meter per second at a hundred meter height. So, uh, but with respect to wind installations, the number which we have right now, which is at 32 uh, megawatts uh, in the coming capacity, this number could be higher as we're likely to see a few more projects to be installed uh, ahead of time to meet the feed-in tariff deadline of uh, 2021. The government has also set targets of 800 megawatts uh, by 2020, 2 gigawatts by 2025, and 6 gigawatts by 2030. Uh, I mean, I believe there's a high chance that they will meet their 2020 uh, targets, but um, time will tell whether they can meet the uh, 2025 as well as the 2030 targets. Um, but if you look at the share of wind uh, of uh, wind energy by 2030, it still is not significant. Uh, it's just um, around 2.1% and it's quite low compared to the other sources of energy uh, during that point of time. Now the government the, came out with quite a few support mechanisms for development of wind projects. Now the notable one being the recent increase in feed-in tariff for onshore projects from 8.5 US cents, uh, from 7.8 US cents to 8.5 US cents, and the offshore tariff to 9.8 US cents. Now, along with that, you know, you have import corporate and land tax exemptions, as well as exemption from environment protection fees. Uh, these are all actually very beneficial for developers to get into a market and and put up their projects and with this attractive um, uh, feed and tariff which is uh, currently not there in any of the markets in southeast asia right now um, it, it's quite impressive for for developing projects there now what this new tariff does is it it has uh, it will ex uh, expedite the development of wind projects uh, in the country now what I've also done is I've put down some key milestones that needs to be achieved before the commercial operation of turbines, uh, and which a lot of these projects will need to do by 2021, October. Um, I'll not go into the details of each of them, but what I'd like to highlight is the Ministry of Industry and Trade approval, which we call as MOIT approval, is the most important approval during the development of the project before the grid and the PP approval. Uh, detailed feasibility studies need to be done to obtain these permits. Uh, I mean, that's, that's mandatory. Typically, the development of projects uh, in Vietnam takes around somewhere between two to four years. Could, could be shorter, could take longer, but typically it's uh, in this range. Uh, most of the land in Vietnam is owned by the government, 
but there are pockets which are privately owned. So one needs to have what we call as land ownership certificate or land user rights certificate to execute projects. The energy production license indicates the commercial operation date of the project. So I'm just trying to give you a certain perspective of how and uh, uh, things work in Vietnam and what is available in Vietnam right now. If you see here, um, I think um, Liming also mentioned uh, uh, initially that there are challenges in in, in Vietnam. Uh, I mean, there are, there are good points, like I mentioned now, and there are the points which we need to take into consideration, which are not that positive as well. And and uh, and that's the PP errors. Um, uh, the uh, we had seen quite a few investors, international investors, abstaining from investing in wind power projects in Vietnam. And that's because the PPA was not bankable or still not bankable from project financing perspective. And, uh, and uh, Olivia will touch on that as well. Now, some of the key concerns are that there is no government guarantee, which means that if EVN defaults, the government will not step in and, and you know, back your project. PPA termination. Now, Circular 2, which was uh, released earlier this year, does not give a clear guidelines on how the losses will be calculated if EVN terminates the PPA. And that's extremely important when, when you're taking or doing project financing. Uh, the governing law is Vietnamese, uh, unlike the standard practice, which is English law in most of the, the countries around the region, and uh, which, is, which is unique for, for Vietnam. The same is true for arbitration, which, uh, which will be done by Renewable Energy Department, which is one of the government entities instead of a neutral country's arbitration agency, such as the Singapore International Arbitration Center, SIAC. Uh, again, like I said, in Southeast Asia, uh, SIAC is uh, the preferred uh, place for arbitration, but in Vietnam, that's not the case. And, and last but not the least, it's curtailment. Um, if EBN curtails your project, there is no take or pay mechanism. So th there are challenges, but it's not, like I said, it's not gloomy because having said that, the government has shown a level of commitment to increase the adoption of renewable projects in its energy mix. There are also various multilaterals working with the government to make the PPA more bankable. This is, an, I would say, it's an exciting period for executing wind projects now that there is feed-in tariff of, of 8.5 US cents and 9.8 US cents, which will expire by end of October 2021. And we're going to see a lot of projects uh, put up during this period. Uh, I would now like to pass on to a panelist, uh, both the panelists are very well established and they will share their insights on this growing market. Uh, first, it would be Olive. Okay, Olivia, the floor is yours. My screen. I hope you see. You can see my screen now. Um, so, good morning, good afternoon, good good evening to everyone. Um, the subject of the day have been uh, uh, largely uh, all the all the all the all the, the, the issues have been largely. Uh, uh, discussed uh, already by or touch upon already by uh, Naveen. Um, I will try to just get give you a very uh, brief overview of uh, our own experience um, uh, of, of financing projects and building projects, uh, wind projects in Vietnam. Uh, first thing, uh, and, and I just uh, uh, listed, uh, you know, the, the main ones. I would say the main ones to start with is the lack of uh, product financing experience and local rules. Uh, uh, of course, as you as you have seen in the in the numbers, uh, there yes. there are very few uh, projects uh, built already in in Vietnam. Uh, it has taken you know, the, the feeding tariff have been out of uh, the previous feeding tariff at 7.8 i've been out, uh, out since uh, 2011 so um, a lot of lot of years 
without much uh, action. Uh, and why? Because there is absolutely no experience, local experience uh, and good practice, no industry um, association whatsoever. And, and, and the international standards, uh, you know, are absolutely absent of the uh, um, uh, from from all the, the projects which have been built so far by local players, because of course uh, so far it has been a, a local uh, uh, market uh, only. We were the, the first ones uh, to, to to build a, uh, an onshore wind farm uh, starting in 2017 and and uh, finished the, the the first project uh, last year. Um, we'll come back to that, but the, on the financing side, uh, project financing also experience is. Uh, totally lacking uh, in Vietnam and, and I would say also in, nearly in the rest of the region where corporate financing is uh, the rule and we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, of course um, Vietnam is uh, you know, still a communist country so highly bureaucratic. Uh, you, you will not, not even you know um, don't imagine how, how bureaucratic as difficult, how difficult it is um, I would say, you know, <laughs> uh, think about Europe or the US in the 50s, uh, that's what you had. Uh, process, uh, processes are at both provincial and Hanoi level, um, uh, well, di quite difficult to follow, I would say, but um, most of all, um, very time consuming. Uh, it will take a lot of time back and forth, having, you know, the right ink at the right corner uh, for the signing uh, of all the, all the documentation. So, uh, very, very cumbersome on the record side. Uh, land compensation, I think uh, this is the key. Uh, this has been, um, uh, you know, the, the key issue for a lot of projects uh, going forward. Uh, and I, I, in the past and, and going forward. Um, so that's, that's a, a big one. Um, as Naveen just uh, uh, touched upon, uh, the land is uh, state owned and uh, you have uh, uh, private uh, um, farmers most of the time, for at least for, for, for onshore projects. Uh, and you, you must compensate the loss of production. So in fact, uh, uh, and Naveen mentioned uh, um, the, the, the different uh, incentives for wind projects in Vietnam, the main one I would say for me is that you don't pay any lease for 50 years, uh, which is uh, a huge advantage, I would say, compared to um, the rest of, of uh, the region or the world. So you don't pay any lease for 50 years, but you need to compensate the farmers from uh, day one uh, of the loss of production. For, for the land you're going to use, so um, so you pay all everything uh, upfront, I would say, um, and um, again with uh, uh, a very bureaucratic and, and uh, uh, known process uh, where you have to, of course, work with the, the local provincial um, government um, and add your your private uh, participation on top of that. Uh, reliable in data. I'm just mentioning this here. Uh, it could seems to be uh, funny to, to think that uh, if we need uh, reliable wind data. Uh, it is not really funny when you look at all the projects uh, all along the coast of uh, Vietnam, uh, which have been uh, developed. Uh, most of them uh, by local players uh, for the last, uh, you know, sometimes uh, six, seven, eight years and which uh, you will find have no reliable and bankable green data, which is, uh, of course, uh, one of the main issues, will, will be one of the main issues for project financing and on the road. Uh, on the permitting side, um, you have, uh, because I've been, uh, you know, of course, uh, the international uh, financiers will ask for the PPA uh, to be signed first. Uh, well, you have, you have a lot of uh, permitting to be done before you get the, to the PPA um, and, and some commitments to make and some proof of funding and everything to be to be um, uh, made before you can find the PPA. But uh, yes, you, you know, again, at the, at the end, you can sign the PPA and uh, it's not like in the Philippines, it's not uh, after construction. Uh, so there's not, not this, such, a, such an issue here. Uh, and the permitting is partly done uh, during uh, construction, that you must uh, take that into account. Uh, the the main, I would say, the key issue today, uh, we are expecting it to resume uh, in the next few months, but uh, is the huge pressure on uh, on grid connections by solar projects. 
uh, as you may have heard, you know, the, the, they have been also uh, very favorable of, uh, of very favorable in the case of of uh, solar. In the case of wind, I would say just favorable, uh, just just okay uh, price uh, for wind now. But uh, the solar projects have uh, been benefiting from from a very favorable fit. Uh, uh, for COD uh, before June, so before next month. So we have seen in the, in the last two years a boom, a, a huge, huge, huge increase um, in, 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 uh, of, uh, of interest, of course, and of investment in solar. And you see there is 17,000 <laughs> megawatts of grid connection application, uh, totally jamming the system, totally jamming EVN, um, and, and uh, which, of course, for which is will be um, uh, out of the way, we hope, uh, in the foreseeable future, but um, um, but for the moment, I've, I've reserved uh, grid capacity a lot. And um, and again, as, as a usual, we have seen that, uh, you know, all over Europe, uh, <laughs> this uh, boom and bust uh, solar fit, uh, exactly the same here. Uh, so will it be a sort of a sort of bust or, or, or back to normal? I don't know. We, we there are the, uh, we are waiting for new uh, fitting tariff for, for solar to uh, be announced. We have, been, we have seen uh, some draft numbers, um, and it might be more back to normal, I would say, than uh, than the solar bust. But uh, but definitely uh, for the moment, uh, curtailment risk and, and the grid uh, acceptance of uh, new projects uh, is really a, a real issue. So. Uh, for, for any project uh, on the grid in, in Vietnam. Um, to finish on the on, on the financing, I would have a lot to say, of course, on the EVN PPA uh, terms. Uh, and I've been, uh, mentioned that, you know, just to uh, uh, wrap up here, no take or pay, Vienna, uh, Vietnamese uh, arbitration, as uh, Navin mentioned, termination. Main concerns, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's, these are the, the, the reasons why uh, most of uh, the international banks will say it's not bankable, we're not interested. Uh, I think uh, looking at it um, again from, from a, a developer and a owner of, of uh, wind farms, uh, you have to take one by one. I think these risks are one by one and I appreciate them one by one. Um, to know how to, to or to take the risk or not to take the risk, but to know exactly what uh, what are we talking about? You know, uh, on the non tech or pay or termination, uh, uh, you know, of course, you know, again, it goes in, in hands with uh, the EVN credit rating, the, so the off taker, the EVN is the, the, the national utility, um, and, and the fact that uh, you know it's not not, not investment grade, so uh, it's starting to be uh, uh, has a credit rating, but um, uh, I guess uh, not not to the investment grade for international banks. Uh, it goes down to to mainly for me uh, your opinion on on Vietnam and on Vietnam growth uh, on the tiger of, of uh, the tiger economy of, of uh, Southeast Asia. Do you really think that uh, EVN could terminate your your uh, your PPA uh, with a you know as maybe mentioned 20 12 percent increase in in demand each year? Uh, Myself, I don't, and, and with demand, you know, growing that way for the, the for the next uh, ten years at least, uh, for me that's absolutely not an, an issue. It's it's uh, yes, of course, it's an, in the PPA, but uh, in reality, uh, what is the risk here? Very, 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 very small. Uh, I would say the not non tech or, or pay is, is more of an issue. It relates to the containment um, I just mentioned with uh, you know, above with uh, solar competition. So this is the, a, a real one. Uh, so far, of course, <laughs> uh, we haven't seen uh, much of that uh, happening, but uh, but the real capacity, the real solar new capacity is just coming online this year. I've been coming online this year and the real wind capacity, new new wind capacity also will come online in the, the next the only just starting you know, this year and, and, and onwards. So uh, curtailment, I think, is ahead of us. Um, and we really, you know, we you really have to rely on the uh, grid impact studies um, to to know what 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 kind of risk you're taking in which part of uh, Vietnam for for this one. Um, the fact that there is no government guarantee is, uh, I find that a little bit funny because uh, you know just tell me where there is a government guarantee uh, now in the, in these days. 
uh, for for renewable projects. Um, you know, maybe for huge, uh, you know, billion dollars uh, hydro uh, projects, maybe. But for the ones we know, you know, solar and, and wind, uh, these 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 times are gone. And uh, I think uh, for the whole, uh, for, for 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 good. So um, we don't don't count on on any government guarantee in that case. Uh, and that's uh, you know, I'm hearing DFIs still DFIs um, complaining that there is no government guarantee, which. For me, it's very, very, very surprising, of course, because I thought that the the the, the meaning of of DFIs were uh, just to talk about you know government to government and and to uh, be able to 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 finance uh, without this uh, uh, formal government guarantee. But uh, that's not the case here. You'll be very surprised uh, um, if you you know, try to to finance uh, your your wind or solar projects in Vietnam to see that uh, you know international banks. For the moment, at least, um, as well as uh, in uh, DFIs, development banks have exactly the same uh, reading. Uh, from again, from what I I, I know for for the moment, uh, same reading. PPA not bankable, so you know we need something else, and we need what is something else? Something else is um, corporate guarantee. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, the issue I think for me is that for the region is more uh, that there is no non-recourse. Project financing available uh, because uh, it's not the history of Asia and it's not the, uh, used in Asia. In Asia, they're used to all the banks and all the you know large, small, uh, local, international. Uh, they are used to uh, uh, project uh, to to corporate financing and balance sheet uh, guarantees. Uh, so, which again, uh, it's not the, the case elsewhere in the in the world. Uh, finish on this. That uh, of course you have the the option to work with the Vietnamese banks. Vietnamese banks uh, are providing um, VND, so Vietnamese Dong, the local currency uh, financing. Um, could be quite long. We we closed uh, last year the first ever uh, non-recourse uh, uh, project financing with a Vietnamese bank for wind project. It was 17 years, so I think uh, yeah, you, you can appreciate it. It's, it's very, quite quite long for 20 years BPA, um, and uh, but but the, the resources uh, are limited. Um, again. Uh, the, type, the size of the three largest uh, Vietnam banks, uh, pre partially state-owned, uh, is quite small. Um, and from my perspective, I don't think uh, they will be able to finance more than the the, the, the first uh, 800 megawatts that Naveen just mentioned, which is the, the first goal um, and the first target uh, for Vietnam uh, for 2020 as um, uh, capacity installed. So uh, uh, I would share um, uh, Naveen uh, uh, a vision that uh, for me, yes, uh, they are quite likely that uh, the 800 megawatts will be done uh, by 2021, uh, and, and most of it will be done by the local uh, players with local banks. Uh, but then, then uh, we'll see. Um, and I'm sharing, I'm sharing the concerns uh, um, of, of Naveen. We'll see how it goes uh, further uh, from this uh, 800 megawatts. And of course, we can come back to that uh, in uh, in the Q and A session. Thank you. Thank you, Olivier. Um, now um, we will turn to our third speaker, um, Bernard Cassie, who is the development director um, of Mainstream. Bernard, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the topic of my presentation today is uh, offshore wind potential and challenges in Vietnam, where I'll bring some experiences we've had with developing an offshore wind project here. Uh, the slide, this, this slide shows the, um, the resource in Vietnam, similar to a slide shown earlier by uh, Naveen. Um, the, as you can see in the map, the wind resource in Vietnam is best in the south, and this is the case for both onshore and offshore. Offshore, we can see a hot zone off Ning Tuan, Bing Tuan, down towards the southern part of the map, um, where the average wind speeds uh, are close to the values in the North Sea of uh, at around 10, 10 meters per second. So this is the area where the developers of the K Ga project are focusing. While the strong wind re speed represents a distinct advantage, uh, the Ningtuan and Bingtuan provinces are the closest landfall 
uh, that have well-documented grid constraints, as was mentioned by Olivia er earlier. Further south of the Mekong Delta, the wind speeds are a bit lower um, in, in the plus, plus or minus seven to eight meter range, but the sites offer the advantage of shallower water and less constrained grid. And this is the area where, where mainstream are developing an offshore wind project uh, that I'll be talking a little bit about later. Um, in terms of planning stages, um, these have been spoken about uh, by the two earlier speakers and the planning, planning for offshore wind is the same, effectively follows the same path as, uh, as, as onshore wind. Although there's one of the challenges we have is um, at the feasibility study stage, um, there's a role for Monray, which is the Ministry of Natural Resource and Environment, that is not very well defined, and um, we're we're currently working on getting a better understanding of of the of the difference between the onshore and the offshore process there. It's it's uh, noteworthy that um, to date there is no offshore wind wind farms built in Vietnam. There's one nearshore wind farm um, in the Bac Liu province. It's a little bit further south of the Sok Chang province that I'll talk about later, where um, a 99 megawatt nearshore wind farm was built um, with walkways out to the turbines. I'll now talk briefly about the offshore PPA. Um, set at 9.8 US cent per kilowatt hour for energy produced from offshore wind, this sits favorably when compared to a number of renewable energy tariff regimes around the world. The bankability issues with the PPA are well documented and have been covered by Naveen and Olivier. I'll talk here briefly about some technical aspects of the PPA. Last year, before the new PPA came out, a number of developers were speculating as to how offshore wind would be, or, or how offshore would be defined. Many proposed projects were in the intertidal zone on mud flats that were dry when the tide was out and at up to five meter water depth when the tide was in. So the decision published in September defined the boundary between onshore and offshore as the lowest average sea level for 18.6 years. So you can see the um, that line shown on uh, just on the coast of Sok Chang there. Um, this led to a scramble to determine where this line lay at various project locations on the coast. Some developers were attempting to calculate the line themselves, some source maps from Monray. We found the most reliable maps to be from the Vietnamese Navy. Uh, another line that's is significant for planning of offshore wind projects is uh, the three mile line, and that's shown in red here. This line is um, understood to be the boundary between the provincial planning control and national planning control. Uh, though in our experience, the control is, uh, is a bit gray and province level still has a significant planning input outside the three mile line. The project that I'm gonna talk a, bit, a little bit more about this morning is located in an offshore area near Ving Chau in the Sok Chang province, uh, the yellow province shown on the Vietnam map on the right. The projects are about five kilometers offshore uh, with a maximum water depth of about 17 meters at high tide. Our first introduction to the project was after a DN, after DNVGL had completed a feasibility study for the, for the Fukuong group under a US TDA grant. Uh, Mainstream is now in joint venture with the Fukuong group to develop these projects that you see on the left of, of your screen. Projects have received international attention with the signing of agreements in Washington in front of the, the Prime Minister. And um, the survey rights for the, the two by 200 megawatt blocks for a 400 megawatt site are, are shown there on the left. And we're, we're planning a, a layout design for a phased development to extend beyond the 400 to a total of 800 megawatts in the area. I'll now talk about some of the development activities over the last year, which kind of highlighted some of the challenges um, for building offshore wind in Vietnam and 
the first slide here shows the wind measurement campaign. So um, when we first came to the project, the Fukuon Group had built an onshore met mast um, and four, four years of wind data had been secured for that. Um, last year, we built uh, an offshore platform to, uh, from which we were measuring wind data on, on LIDAR. And uh, this has provided valuable insight into construction in this nearshore environment, what ports to use, what times of the year are best for installation. And we've used a Vietnamese contractor um, and have been well impressed by the quality of construction and the quality of the installation works. Um, the next slide shows uh, discusses the Met Ocean campaign um, that included a bathymetric survey to establish water depths and installation of instruments on the seabed to measure wave height. And we've had very good collaboration with the University of Science in Ho Chi Minh in this work. And we now have graduates from the university working with us. A big challenge for the work has been fishing activities with a number of seabed instruments going missing, likely dragged by fishing nets. So clearly for any offshore wind projects, um, uh, it'll be very important to reach, uh, to reach agreements with fishermen for both the construction and operation phase. Some geotechnical investigation work was completed as part of the DNVGL study, and we've contracted Fugro to commence a detailed geotechnical investigation shortly. A feature of the site, as indeed common with all the uh, projects in the Mekong Delta, is a very soft clay. Um, that means long pile foundations will be necessary. Another feature of all projects in Vietnam is a UXO or, or unexploded ordnance risk. It's a sad fact that more than 10,000 people have been killed in Vietnam since the end of the war from accidentally standing on or mishandling buried, buried, uh, buried munitions left over after the war. Our research has shown that the nearshore sites, uh, that, that, that nearshore sites were also bombed off the coast to target army vessels. So the survey for potential UXO and the removal of any bombs found is a significant uh, um, undertaking um, for for projects in Vietnam in areas where with, that are considered at risk. So we've contracted, uh, this whole area is heavily regulated uh, in Vietnam. It must be done by a division of the military, both the survey work and the removal of any bombs that are found. So we've contracted a Lung Lo Corporation, a division of the military to do this work. And if you see at the bottom of the screen there, um, Again, heavily regulated uh, the area around which uh, you must investigate. So in our case, it's a 70 meter diameter circle around each of the turbine locations. The, the other key studies that are ongoing um, are the environmental impact, impact assessment work. Um, the, this includes two elements, the ESIA, that's being undertaken by your ERM and it will be necessary to secure international project finance. And then the regulatory EIA, which is ongoing by the Institute of Energy. That's included, and the, 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 the work has included dry and wet season bird surveys. A key element of, um, of the project is the onshore grid connection. And um, I guess, um, that was mentioned by the previous speakers about land compensation being a big issue. Thankfully, land compensation is one of the uh, non-issues when you're building offshore. Um, however, um, land compensation is uh, is a, a topic for the onshore grid connection route, and um, and that's a topic that we're in uh, heavily involved in at the moment with this showing the the uh, route of the the grid connection for the project. In terms of um, offshore wind, I think um, a significant difference between onshore and offshore is that the, the foundation costs for an offshore wind farm can represent up to a third of the overall project cost, whereas for an onshore wind farm, it may be only perhaps less than 10%. Um, 
so we're putting a lot of effort into establishing the best foundation concepts for the for the for the project as well as establishing what are the resources or what what's what is the supply chain uh, like in vietnam to to build the foundation concepts that might be suitable so on the left you see the the monopile foundation concept that's been designed it'll be a six meter diameter monopile we've established that there is no um fabrication facilities in Vietnam that can deal with this concept if it was selected and so that would be constructed outside Vietnam. The concept on the right is a a, a reinforced concrete um, multi-piled cap can be built in Vietnam with Vietnamese technology and was the concept used for the Bac Liu project but is a very slow installation process and because the Projects are in a hurry now to uh, achieve the deadline of the tariff published by government in September last year. So uh, it, it will be probably difficult to see a concept like the concept on the right um, meeting the project schedule requirements. So just wrapping up then, um, key further key uh, development milestones for the project, um, tender process for the turbine supply and balance the plant later this year and um, securing the, the PPA grid connection agreement and the environmental approvals towards the end of this year financial close at the uh, towards the the mid mid 2020 and construction start thereafter so that brings me to the end of my presentation I'll hand back to you now Liming Oh, thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Thanks, thanks all the speakers for your very, um, very elaborative and very informative um, presentations. Um, and now we come to the time of the um, Q and A. We've got a few. Um, let me start one um, with uh, maybe all of you, if you want to. Um, want to answer the all, all three speakers um we know that the cutoff date for the current um feed-in tariff is by 2021 um do you have any insight on what will happen after 2021 and uh yeah what, what do you think of that and there are also discussions about maybe an auction um to replace the feed-in tariff what's your view on the auction versus feed-in tariff issue um, maybe this one goes to olivier first and then um, Naveen. Uh, yes, thank you. I, I don't have any uh, for the moment insight on uh, what uh, could be the next uh, scheme, a tariff scheme for Vietnam. We are, as usual, uh, hearing a lot of uh, rumors and uh, you know numbers around. Um, we'll see. I think first, first indication should come from solar, the solar uh, side, uh, where after. Uh, quite again quite uh, 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 interesting uh, or favorable uh, fitting tariff uh, for two years uh, um, the, we have heard and they, they have been draft uh, around also on the, what would be the what could be the, the new uh, solar project uh, uh, fitting tariff uh, which is uh, in fact much more elaborated than um, most thought uh, with uh, 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 four tariffs, or potentially four tariffs, four different tariffs, uh, according to the solar irrigation show. So that that's uh, again uh, very clever, and, and uh, maybe uh, uh, you know again we can think of uh, something uh, similar for for wind. Uh, what we have seen also is that uh, um, surprisingly, uh, IFC, for example, have uh, been uh, uh, advocating. Uh, and lobbying uh, the government for um, uh, bidding, uh, putting in place the bidding rounds for wind. Uh, whereas for me, I think uh, uh, this this is of course the best way to uh, uh, get to maybe the, the, the optimal price uh, for wind power in in a country. But once the project, the, the site, the the market, sorry, in the um, in the sector is mature. 
uh, which is absolutely not the case uh, in Vietnam, as we just mentioned. There's only very, you know, very, very few products. I think uh, uh, there's less than uh, built as we speak, built today. There are less than 10 projects uh, up and running. So in the whole of Vietnam, so uh, you know, very, very few uh, projects have been uh, built. You know, in, in in nearly 10 years' uh, time. So so it's doing, there's nearly nothing done for the moment. So we're going straight from this. Um, um, environment uh, up to bidding, I think, is the recipe for disaster. Uh, we have seen that, you know, again, a lot of times uh, elsewhere. Um, we have seen in South Africa how, how it had been dealt with, um, and um, in, in some countries of Europe. So, again, I'm, I'm still, of course, uh, a big fan of uh, feeding tariff if it's at the right price. Um, and feeding tariff will just uh, regulate itself uh, what which projects are feasible, which projects are not feasible, and that's the the, the best way to uh, I would say regulate maybe the interest from the soil, from the the private sector. Let me just just to add, uh, actually I concur with uh, uh, Olivia here. It's um, I mean uh, what what we could see. Uh, potentially is maybe the government might use how they're doing for solar. Like Olivia said, maybe they break it down into zones. Uh, it's unlikely uh, that they will go in straight into an auction at this stage. Uh, same as Olivia said, market is new. Uh, it, it, I think the government had asked MOIT to start looking at the auctions and mechanism and MOIT has kind of involved the World Bank as well to come up with the auction design. And typically coming up with an auction design uh, does take time. And, and at the same time, it's not a very simple process. Uh, so I, I would feel that it's, it's definitely going to be very difficult to get it by 2021. Um, many mature markets have taken many years to, to get the, to the auction stage. Uh, so yeah, we'll have to wait and see. But uh, people are talking that it might either go into auctions or it might go into the solar way. We don't know. We'll just have to wait and see. Okay, thank you. Um, the next one goes to uh, Bernard. It's about offshore. Um, people were interested in the intertidal projects. Um, there are one project which is intertidal. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more which the tariff they are using for intertidal and do you see more intertidal projects coming online in the future or you see more uh, offshore following your suit after your um, your projects? Um, and also I think uh, there are also questions about asking um, the general question about um, how many years do you see realistically to see like re re offshore projects being developed? Of course, yours uh, are the ones, but do you see others also coming into the play for the offshore? Yeah, I suppose maybe for your first question, uh, the existing project, the Back Liu project, um, was built before the current tariff came out, and the developer, the Kong Lee Group, um, negotiated. Um, a bespoke tariff for that. It's not. It's. I think there's. It's probably semi-public knowledge, but um, I didn't. Don't want to speculate on um, something that hasn't been kind of published formally. Um, but uh, so that's the existing Backliu project. Um, in terms of of other uh, intertidal area projects, I guess. Um, there's a fundamental question now that uh, developers who are working in the intertidal area and maybe have discovered that their projects are, in fact, maybe some or all of their projects are 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 qualifying as onshore projects simply because of the position of the low tide line, um, and they're therefore not getting the offshore tariff. Um, I would think that their financial models are probably under severe strain. So it'll be interesting to see how the government deals with that. And um, I know there's a lot of lobbying going on around that topic. Um, projects who had in good faith perhaps un understood that they were offshore projects because um, when the tide comes in, they're, they're underwater and they have significant costs for development. Um, but under the strict interpretation of the definition of onshore versus offshore, uh, they now don't get the offshore tariff. So 
I think a lot of developers will be watching this space to see whether there's any resolution from the government for that topic. Um, so I think it's a wait and see. Um, in terms, just to follow on from the um, the previous question, I think uh, the the issue of what happens after November 2021 is particularly significant, I think, for offshore projects because because of the long uh, development cycle time um, and the longer construction time. Um, I think it would be folly if if the government um, went straight to to an auction process uh, after November because um, the whole uh, it would give very little confidence to the supply chain here to to ramp up for a, a big offshore industry um, if 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 we went straight to auctions. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, my next question is back to the um, finance, 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 the product finance. Um, Olivia mentioned that uh, the local banks will not um, fund finance product of over 800 megawatts. And uh, we also see that um, there is a trend that international banks, some of them, are now teaming up with the local banks and um, finance project via them, via the local banks. Is this some trend that you want to uh, maybe share a little bit insight into? Um, I mean, for both Olivier and Naveen, and maybe Naveen can also introduce a little bit on the finance workshop that we are organizing, on how we are going to organize that issue, um, present that issue. Yeah, if if I just may, um, um, before you, sorry, but Navin, just just before you, you introduce the um, uh, the workshop and uh, and your your point of view on this. Uh, for myself, and having again worked with uh, the local banks and international banks also for um, onshore project financing, uh, the main issue is uh, uh, the the security and the security package that international banks uh, could have uh, in Vietnam. Um, and and on that part. As far as I understand, as far as uh, I know, um, banks, international banks without um, uh, a license uh, in Vietnam will not be able, will not be able, because you cannot, you know, have a, uh, as a foreigner, you cannot have land uh, security uh, uh, enforced. Uh, so there will, there, there is a, that, that's the main constraint for me and what I've heard. And again, uh, the local banks, of course, will, will can enforce uh, their security on the land um, or even on the turbines if, if you go that way. But uh, the land is, of course, uh, the, the main uh, uh, mortgageable asset uh, for the financiers, uh, whereas uh, international banks will not be able to do it. So, uh, so, so it, it, it nearly kills or nearly kills the direct financing from international banks um, in Vietnam. Uh, Again, uh, so so far, uh, or oblige these uh, international banks to have a local to use their, their local branch if they have, uh, or use a, a local uh, bank uh, to do it. Um, uh, you know, so again, so so that that's that that has been the case so far. Uh, maybe you know new new ways to secure uh, the financiers will be found um, in the future, but uh, for the moment, I think that's the. Uh, the, the, the the main issue and the, and the main reason you're referring to uh, the main why why uh, most of the of the financing have been uh, or all of the financing have been through uh, uh, local banks uh, at one stage. Yes, Naveen. Yes, Naveen. Yeah, hi. Can you hear me? Can you hear me, Limin? Yes, yes. Yeah. Please so, forward. I mean, I just just want to add that uh, I think um, there, there have been a couple of projects where uh, the international banks and the local banks have come together uh, with the coverage from uh, export credit agencies, ECAs. And, uh, and I'm not saying that that's going to be uh, the norm, uh, but there have been, uh, it has been successfully done. 
the banks that have done this may or may not use this as a cookie cutter model, but uh, they they will be exploring this option for future wind projects. Uh, so that, some of these will be touched upon in our, in our finance workshop. So uh, we we have um, the two sessions for our finance workshop. The first one is uh, the, the challenges and risk mitigation in uh, financing and projects, where we, we are bringing a combination of um, multilateral uh, uh, and multilateral banks, the, the local bank, and as well as the international bank to, to get their, their views and, and point of uh, uh, perspectives. And, and then we have a second session where we're talking about alternate sources of financing. Now, like uh, all of us have uh, now, uh, if, if you can't do project financing uh, or pure non recourse financing, are there other ways to secure financing? Is, is there any alternate sources of financing? So, we're going to be talking about that as well. And there we will have again uh, uh, some funds, uh, uh, export credit agency like EKF. Uh, AIIB uh, and a commercial bank coming on board in the panel. So, uh, so as you can see, both the session one and two will have a good mix of commercial banks, uh, local bank, uh, multilateral export credit agency, and um, uh, developers. So, yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting session on on workshop. Okay, thank you, thank you, Naveen, and thank, thanks our um, speakers. Um, I think um, that's all for the questions, and I'll hand over back to my colleague um, who will do some um, housekeeping announcement. View the recording of today's webinar. If you did submit a question today which wasn't answered, we will follow up by email afterwards. On behalf of GWEC and all of our speakers, thank you for joining us today and enjoy the rest of the day.